Uh, good morning once again, and of course we have the situation of Murphy's Law. So um, we'll go ahead and, and begin. I want to say uh, good morning, and the Committee of Homeland Security, Justice, and Public Safety. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the first Crime Prevention Symposium. I'd like to recognize members of the Committee on Homeland Security, Justice, and Public Safety, and non-committee members present here today. And we have, of course, the Vice Chair, Senator Kenneth Gittins, Senator Jean Ford, Senator Harrigan was excused, Senator Nelly O'Reilly had an accident last night, and um, we are wishing her a speedy recovery in that matter. We also have Senator Armando Rocky Liburd here with us this morning, as well as Senator Samuel Sanders. Non-committee members, of course, present this morning is Senator, Senate President Neville James, Senator Positive Nelson, Senator Trigenza Roach, and Senator Kurt VLA, and we'll be hearing from those individuals a little bit later on. Today's topic, the school to prison pipeline is a national phenomenon that has negatively impacted our communities and our youth and our future. I'm proud to partner with the University of the Virgin Islands, uh, Dr. David Hall and Dr. Kimberly Mills in bringing this critical conversation to the community. As the chairman of the Legislative Committee on Homeland Security, Justice and Public Safety, I often hear from the agencies at the end of the pipeline, our correctional facility or correction system. In fact, my colleagues and I hear from the agency's organization along the school prison pipeline. What we don't often hear is a collaborative approach, one that involves government, community organization, and the residents who must live with the realities and consequences of the school to prison pipeline every single day. Today's symposium is not to point fingers or blame, but instead to have a meaningful discussion and ways that we can narrow this pipeline and break the cycle that has contributed to many of our young people not reaching their full potential as members of this society. Our goal is to move towards a framework that catches those students before they get into the pipeline and that creates a network of services and solution to this problem. I spent a lot of years in my profession in law enforcement and I serve as the supervisor and commander of the Youth Investigation Bureau and I know many of times we had what's called the revolving door where we saw the same young individuals day in day out and they graduate from minor offenses and before we know it they graduate into major offenses and if we could just stop for a moment and really think about the potential of those individuals if we were able to curb their action at the initial stage, if we were able to redirect those energy, if we were able to get into the minds and hearts of those individuals, they could be productive citizens of this community. But unfortunately, there are instances where they have fell through the cracks and end up from school to prison. So today, we're hoping to come up with some solutions to actually break that issue. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to participate in today's discussion. It is evident that your presence here uh, today reflects that it will take a community effort to resolve the challenges that are contributing to the national recognized issue. And when we talk about national recognized issue, I know that there was some debate uh, just nationally or, or discussion recently where one of the Democratic candidates actually spoke about um, appropriating $2 billion just to work towards the school to prison pipeline and another $30 billion over a four year period of time to really go towards education and putting the money where their mouths are. So today we have um, some invited panelists and I just wanted to quickly um, recognize each of them and then we could go into the, uh, we'll hear from the President of the Legislature real quickly for some brief welcome as well as the uh, President of the University of the Virgin Islands. So today we have Senator Kenneth Gittins, again my Vice Chair, uh, who's serving as a panelist. We also have Senator Gene Ford. We have Senator Positive Nelson, Senator Kurt VLA. Uh, we have from the Attorney General's Office, Mr. Joe Pontine. Uh, thank you for being here. We have from the Virgin Islands Police Department, the Honorable Delroy Richards. 
We also have from the Department of Human Services, Ms. Lanier Hector, who serves as a, a director. We have from the Department of Education, the Legal Counsel, Mr. Al Vincent Hudson. We have from the Department of Labor, um, well, I don't see the representative here yet, so I'm hoping that they join us at some point. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Webster, for being here. Um, we also have from the Office of the Public Defender, the Deputy Chief uh, Defender, Hannibal O'Brien. And uh, from the Bureau of Corrections, we have Chief Calvin, uh, Calvin Herbert, as well as the, the warden is also here, and we'll hear from them shortly. We also have from the Community Foundation of the Virgin Islands, President D. Brown. Thank you for being here. For my brother's workshop, we have Chris Finch and Scott Bradley. And from Victorious Believers uh, Ministry, we have Pastor Regina Perry. We also have from the St. Croix Foundation, Executive Director Deanna James. And I just ask that you give each of those panel uh, individuals a round of applause. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, Senate President Neville James to just come up in and do a few welcoming remarks. Senate President James. Good morning, everyone. Round of applause for Senator Francis and his staff for putting this symposium together. <laughs> On behalf of the 31st legislature, I definitely want to say that I'm glad that I'm a part of the body. Um, we have a freshman senator and Senator Francis, so the people of St. Croix need to be commended for exercising uh, a wonderful vote in 2014 because while he may be a freshman, clearly he brings a vast knowledge of experience coming from a background in law enforcement. Uh, today's symposium is not only important, but it's timely. Um, we have a crime problem here in the Virgin Islands, and there are some realities that we need to face and I'm hoping and I'm confident that today's panel will address those areas. For me personally, my concern is I believe that we have a literacy problem here on the island of St. Croix. I think um, as politicians, we have skirted the issue because it's apolitical. Uh, it, uh, people get the impression that when you say that, you're calling people's children down when in fact, uh, what we're doing is we're calling out a problem that we need to recognize. The reality is a lack of literacy limits your ability to be rational and it creates irrational behavior. And it is irrational behavior that has created a crime problem here on St. Croix. Having said that, I want to make it clear. I'm, I'm, excuse me, I forget that I'm the Senate president in the Virgin Islands. Uh, our problem is no different from anywhere else. And one thing that we must do as a people is we must stand up and not allow ourselves to be isolated and ostracized and given the impression that crime only exists in the Virgin Islands. This is not to say that uh, we're proud of it because the symposium here today is proof that the Senate, the Senator of the, Chairman, the Committee on Homeland Security, Justice and Public Safety is working along with his colleagues to make sure that we address the problem, we do what we can do and we focus on the little things and hopefully the sum of the parts will end up in a very fruitful and true reflection of what we know is paradise. Earlier today, I had the pleasure of participating in a uh, hundred, I think it's a hundred man march. Uh, the university is to be commended under the president, under the leadership of Senator, um, not Senator, President David Howe. And uh, we intend to work in collaboration with the University of the Virgin Islands because we believe as a legislature that the university plays a critical part in the advancement of us as a people. Once again, on behalf of the legislature, I want to thank all of you for attending. I definitely want to commend my freshman senator and senators and all the members of the 31st legislature. I see we have the ranking member from St. John here, and we also have my classmate from uh, the 26th legislature, Senator Nelson. And I personally want to thank you for not wearing a tie today because uh, some of us are looking dapper, like Senator, Nel Senator VLA and all of them shop, and even Senator Labour who don't like to wear a tie, wearing a tie today. And uh, we're looking good. But Senator Nelson, it isn't about how you look, it's about what you bring to the table. And I think that's what we need to be focusing on. Thank you very much, Senator Francis. Congratulations to you and your staff once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. And now we'll hear from the President of the University of the Virgin Islands, Dr. David Hall.
Good morning, everyone. It is an honor for the university to help host this important and timely conference. We want to thank uh, Senator <coughs> Francis and the committee uh, for spearheading this and all members of the legislature and of the public uh, who are present. Uh, we do this because it is critical to our mission to serve the uh, Virgin Islands in the ways that are most critical. And when you have a prison to a uh, school to prison pipeline, it means that so many of our youth are not ending up where we believe they should, and that is here at the University of the Virgin Islands, so that they can develop the skills and insights and leadership to transform uh, this territory uh, and the world. Uh, we are very honored that uh, Dr. Uh, <coughs> Kimberly Mills will be uh, presenting uh, some of her work on uh, this particular problem, which she has researched and will be able to hopefully uh, aid to uh, our uh, discussion. This is a very timely problem. Uh, it is something that we believe that the individuals in this room uh, working collaboratively can address. And if we take that attitude with problems like this, we can make a difference. The university stands with you. Uh, to do whatever we can uh, to reverse uh, this particular uh, challenge and dilemma, and we hope that what you do today will be extremely fruitful. Uh, welcome again, and I hope that you enjoy your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hall, and without further ado, I'd like to call the main event uh, presenter this morning, Dr. Kimberly Mills, and just to read her bio, um, real quickly uh, before she comes up. Dr. Kimberly Mills is an international expert in the field of develop developmental disabilities, educational training, and program development. Dr. Mills has spent 20 years of experience working with youth with the varying e educational exceptionalities, including autism, giftedness, emotional disturbances, and behavior disorders learning disabilities, mild and moderate severe intellectual disabilities, ADD and ADHD, traumatic brain injuries, blindness, Asperger uh, syndrome, and more. Dr. Mills has worked extensively with young people with typical, typically developing and exceptional needs in the variety of settings, including general education classrooms, self-contained classrooms, therapeutic well, wellness, wellness schools, residential settings, private centers, private schools, military bases, juvenile detention facilities, courtrooms, psychoeducational programs, university classroom, and home-based settings. Dr. Mills received her Bachelor's of Arts from Emory University in English and History in 1995, followed by a Master's of Education in Behavioral Learning Disabilities from Georgia State University in 2001. In disabilities from the, U in 2007, Dr. Mills completed her PhD in education from the University of Hawaii in the field of exceptionalities with a focus on behavior disorders and a cognate in multicultural education. In 2009, she was certified as an educational administrator and school leader through the University of Georgia. In 2011, Dr. Mills completed a certificate in behavioral analysis from the University of North Texas. In 2012, she was certified as a behavior analyst through the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. Dr. Mills has provided service consultation and expertise around the disability issue in diverse locations throughout the continental United States and locations around the world, including Japan, Hawaii, Bermuda, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Middle East. Dr. Mills has worked on several national and international policy initiatives, including helping to rewrite the Georgia Juvenile Justice Legal Codes advising on changes in special education regulation in the state of Georgia and helping to ensure that nonprofit organizations in the country of Bermuda exercise practices and adherence with the best international standards and indicator for civil wellness. Dr. Mills is currently the Associate Director of the University of the Virgin Islands Center of Excellence in Dev Dev Developmental uh, Disabilities. Dr. Mills is an internationally renowned speaker, published author, education trainer, and an educational and legislative policy advocate, which has been featured at disability, educational, legal, and social service conferences around the globe as an expert in the field of research-based service delivery to youth and disabilities, autism, learning challenges, and those considered to be at risk. 
At this time, I'd like to call on Dr. Kimberly Mills, our presenter for the School to Prison Pipeline. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. Uh, I usually just refer to myself as a special educator. <laughs> Well, this is an awesome opportunity. I'm so pleased to see so many of us here today and gather together around this critically important issue. Um, thank you, President Hall, for your support uh, in this collaborative between the university and the legislature. And again, welcome and thank you to all of our panelists. We're going to jump right in. And uh, hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you all are going to have um, an excellent idea about the exact nature of this problem, phenomenon, epidemic. And more importantly, you're going to have a great idea about specific research-based techniques and strategies for us to solve these problems. So I am with an organization called VIU said, and one of our main mandates is to really bridge that gap between research and practice. That, that really is our mandate. And what you will find today is the research and the practice. And, and as a group and as a community, we're going to put these things together and actively work to solve these problems. So whenever I present on this topic, I always just have to take a minute and recognize a student who I'll call by the name of Jay. And he's really the person that started me on this path of kind of looking at these issues regarding school failure and intersection with juvenile justice. In 1999, I was working as a paraprofessional at a psychoeducational program. And I had a class, we had a little bit of everybody, kids with severe emotional disturbances, autism, intellectual disabilities, and just a host of challenges. One of the students in the classroom was a 10-year-old by the name of Jay. And, uh, he had had quite a significant involvement with juvenile justice settings, even at the age of 10. And I remember at one point, you know, he was doing really well in the class. We were doing all kinds of innovative things, we were, you know, making ice cream and learning things. And he was really enjoying coming to school. And on one particular occasion, the school social worker came and said that, oh, the student has a court date coming up for something or so forth or some sort of probation violation that happened at the ripe old age of 10. And you know, I said to the social worker, boy, you know, I wish I could, I wish I could go with you and uh, speak to the judge. And he says, oh, well, what would you say? I said, well, if I had the opportunity to speak to the judge, what I would say is, don't lock him up. <laughs> you know, let him stay in my classroom because he's doing really, really well. And you know, but at the time, I, I wasn't even a fully certified teacher at the time, and, and I didn't really fully have the words. And lo and behold, you know, he went back to court, and because of some minor probation violation, you know, he was reincarcerated. And I don't know, several months later, we saw him again, and he was really uh, a changed boy. Uh, he was kind of coming to school, but very reluctantly. And I think we may have seen him about three days, and then he just disappeared. Well, shortly thereafter, I was visiting uh, with my great aunt. And uh, as, I, as I arrived at the house, she said, did you hear this story about uh, the 11-year-old boy that took the police on a high-speed chase on Georgia 400? And you know, he, when they caught him, he had a counterfeit $50 bill. And something about that array of details. <laughs> I was like, oh, did they show his picture? Of course, they didn't show his picture because he's a minor. But something told me, I bet that is my student. And lo and behold, it was my student. He was in a stolen car. <laughs> and uh, he had just, well, you can just guess the rest of the details. So he was, of course, reincarcerated. I continued my educational career. And I you know, went off to Hawaii and started my dissertation and did some teaching there. And in 2004, I came back to Georgia and took a position at the Fulton County Juvenile Court. And just on a lark, I said to myself, you know, I wonder ever whatever became of the student. And I kind of put his name in the system. And what I discovered was that 
surely he was in the system with a magnitude of charges piled on since when I last saw him at 10 or 11 years old. And really he was 17 and in a juvenile setting but simply waiting till he turned 18 so he could be transferred to adult prison. And what I quickly realized is that I, I sort of watched this young man across his lifespan and, and it was a, a real life example of the school to prison phenomenon. Now fortunately, the work that I was doing there in Georgia, um, you know, he really inspired me on a great path and um, we were able to do some ma pretty magnificent uh, things in Georgia, some of which I'll share about today. But just like to recognize that young man who was unfortunately a, a victim of this. So we really have to ask ourselves a question as we come together today. Some of us have children, everybody has family and cousins and young people that they're involved with, and we see kids, they're young, they're bright-eyed, they're bushy-tailed, you know, the children are the future, and then at some point we basically have an issue where this is, this is their future and this is their outcome. So our question is, what is it and what can we do to target it and, and how do we, you know, how do we address the problem? Now, for the sake of time, I won't poll the audience and, and ask you what you think some of the reasons are, but I'm sure that you could elicit some, some uh, suggestions and possibilities of how we need to work together to target this. But what I'm going to do is, uh, as we lay the foundation for this work and this discussion that we're going to do today, I'm going to actually share uh, a TED Talk. If you're not familiar with TED, it's Ideas Worth Spreading. Fantastic organization. And of course, uh, Michelle Alexander wrote an amazing book called The New Jim Crow, which references uh, much of this um, uh, research around the school to prison pipeline. And just briefly, I'm going to share a short video. Uh, the last time I shared it, the audience was just very much impacted. So I want you to have that opportunity. So we're going to view a short video, and then we're going to dive right back into the presentation. the path that American children travel to adulthood, two institutions oversee the journey. The first is the one we hear a lot about, college. Some of you may remember the excitement that you felt when you first set off for college. Some of you may be in college right now and you're feeling this excitement at this very moment. College has some shortcomings. It's expensive. It leaves young people in debt. But all in all, it's a pretty good path. Young people emerge from college with pride and with great friends and with a lot of knowledge about the world and perhaps most importantly, a better chance in the labor market than they had before they got there. Today I want to talk about the second institution overseeing the journey from childhood to adulthood in the United States. And that institution is prison. Young people on this journey are meeting with probation officers instead of with teachers. They're going to court dates instead of to class. Their junior year abroad is instead a trip to a state correctional facility. And they're emerging from their 20s not with degrees in business and English, but with criminal records. This institution is also costing us a lot about $40,000 a year to send a young person to prison in New Jersey. 
But here, taxpayers are footing the bill, and what kids are getting is a cold prison cell and a permanent mark against them when they come home and apply for work. There are more and more kids on this journey to adulthood than ever before in the United States, and that's because in the past 40 years, our incarceration rate has grown by 700 percent. I have one slide for this talk. Here it is. Here's our incarceration rate, about 716 people per 100,000 in the population. Here's the OECD countries. What's more, it's poor kids that we're sending to prison, too many drawn from African-American and Latino communities, so that prison now stands firmly between the young people trying to make it and the fulfillment of the American dream. The problem's actually a bit worse than this, because we're not just sending poor kids to prison, we're saddling poor kids with court fees, with probation and parole restrictions, with low-level warrants, we're asking them to live in halfway houses and on house arrest, and we're asking them to negotiate a police force that is entering poor communities of color not for the purposes of promoting public safety, but to make arrest counts, to line city coffers. This is the hidden underside to our historic experiment in punishment. Young people worried that at any moment they will be stopped, searched, and seized not just in the streets, but in their homes, at school, and at work. I got interested in this other path to adulthood when I was myself a college student attending the University of Pennsylvania in the early 2000s. Penn sits within a historic African-American neighborhood, so you've got these two kind of parallel journeys going on simultaneously. The kids attending this elite private university and the kids from the adjacent neighborhood, some of whom are making it to college, and many of whom are being shipped to prison. In my sophomore year, I started tutoring a young woman uh, who was uh, in high school, who lived about 10 minutes away from the university. Soon her cousin came home from a juvenile detention center. He was 15, a freshman in high school. I began to get to know him and his friends and family, uh, and I asked him what he thought about me writing about his life for my senior thesis in college. This senior thesis uh, became a dissertation at Princeton and now a book. By the end of my sophomore year, I moved into the neighborhood and I spent the next six years uh, trying to understand what young people were facing uh, as they came of age. The first week I spent in this neighborhood, I saw two boys, five and seven years old, play this game of chase where the older boy ran after the other boy. Uh, he played the cop. When the cop caught up to the younger boy, he pushed him down, handcuffed him with imaginary handcuffs, took a quarter out of the other child's pockets uh, asked, saying, I'm seizing that. He asked the child if he was uh, carrying any drugs or if he had a warrant. Many times I saw this game repeated. Sometimes children would simply give up running and stick their bodies flat against the ground with their hands above their heads or flat up against a wall. Children would yell at each other, I'm going to lock you up. I'm going to lock you up and you're never coming home. Once I saw a six-year-old child pull another child's pants down and try to do a cavity search. In the first 18 months that I lived in this neighborhood, uh, I wrote down every time I saw any contact between police and, and people that uh, were my neighbors. So in the first 18 months, uh, I watched the police stop pedestrians or people in cars, search people, run people's names, chase people through the streets, pull people in for questioning, or make an arrest every single day, with five exceptions. 52 times I watched the police break down doors, chase people through houses, or make an arrest of someone in their home. 14 times in this first year and a half, I watched the police punch, choke, kick, stomp on, or beat young men after they had caught them. Bit by bit, I got to know two brothers, Chuck and Tim. Chuck was 18 when we met, a senior in high school. Uh, he was playing on the basketball team and making C's and B's. His younger brother, Tim, was 10. And Tim uh, loved Chuck. He followed him around a lot, looked to Chuck to be a mentor. 
Uh, they lived with their mom and grandfather in a two-story row home with a front lawn and a back porch. Their mom was struggling with addiction all while the boys were growing up. Uh, she never really was able to hold down a job for very long. It was their grandfather's pension that supported the family, not really enough to pay for food and clothes and school supplies for growing boys. The family was really struggling. So when we met, Chuck was a senior in high school. He had just turned 18. Um, that winter, uh, a kid in the schoolyard called Chuck's mom a crack whore. Chuck pushed the kid's face into the snow, and the school cops charged him with aggravated assault. The other kid was fine the next day. I think it was his pride that was injured more than anything. Um, but anyway, since Chuck was 18, this ag assault case sent him to adult county jail on State Road in Northeast Philadelphia, where he sat uh, unable to pay the bail. Uh, he couldn't afford it, while the trial dates dragged on and on and on through almost his entire senior year. Finally, near the end of this season, um, the judge on this assault case threw out most of the charges and Chuck came home uh, with only a few hundred dollars worth of court fees hanging over his head. Tim was pretty happy that day. The next fall, Chuck tried to re-enroll as a senior, but the school secretary told him that he was then 19 and too old to be readmitted. Then the judge on his assault case issued him a warrant for his arrest because he couldn't pay the $225 in court fees that came due a few weeks after the case ended. Then he was a high school dropout living on the run. Tim's first arrest came later that year after he turned 11. Chuck had managed to get his warrant lifted and he was on a payment plan for the court fees and he was driving Tim to school in his girlfriend's car. So a cop pulls him over, runs the car, and the car comes up as stolen in California. Chuck had no idea where in the history of this car it had been stolen. His girlfriend's uncle bought it from a used car auction in Northeast Philly. Chuck and Tim had never been outside of the tri-state, let alone to California. But anyway, the cops down at the precinct uh, charged Chuck with receiving stolen property. And then a juvenile judge, a few days later, um, charged Tim, age 11, with accessory to receiving stolen property. Uh, and then he was placed on three years of probation. With this probation sentence hanging over his head, Chuck sat his little, little brother down and began teaching him how to run from the police. They would sit side by side on their back porch looking out onto the shared alleyway, and Chuck would coach Tim how to spot undercover cars how to negotiate a late night police raid, how and where to hide. I want you to imagine for a second what Chuck and Tim's lives would be like if they were living in a neighborhood where kids were going to college, not prison. A neighborhood like the one I got to grow up in. Okay, you might say, but Chuck and Tim, you know, kids like them, they're committing crimes. Don't they deserve to be in prison? Don't they deserve to be living in fear of arrest? Well, my answer would be no, they don't. And certainly not for the same things that other young people with more privilege are doing with impunity. If Chuck had gone to my high school, that schoolyard fight would have ended there as a schoolyard fight. It never would have become an aggravated assault case. Not a single kid that I went to college with has a criminal record right now. Not a single one. But can you imagine how many might have if the police had stopped those kids and searched their pockets for drugs as they walked to class or had raided their frat parties in the middle of the night? Okay, you might say, but doesn't this high incarceration rate partly account for our really low crime rate? You know, crime is down, that's a good thing. Yeah, totally, that is a good thing. Crime is down. Uh, dropped precipitously in the 90s and through the 2000s. But according to a committee of academics convened by the National Academy of Sciences last year, the relationship between our historically high incarceration rates and our low crime rate is pretty shaky. It turns out that the crime rate goes up and down irrespective of how many young people we send to prison. We tend to think about justice in a pretty narrow way, good and bad, innocent and guilty. Injustice is about being wrongfully convicted. So if you're convicted of something you did do, you should be punished for it. They're innocent and guilty people, they're victims and they're perpetrators. 
Maybe we could think a little bit more broadly than that. Right now, we're asking kids who live in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods, who have the least amount of family resources, who are attending the country's worst schools, who are facing the toughest time in the labor market, who are living in neighborhoods where violence is an everyday problem. We're asking these kids to walk the thinnest possible line, to basically never do anything wrong. Why are we not providing support to young kids facing these challenges? Why are we offering only handcuffs, jail time, and this fugitive existence? Can we imagine something better? Can we imagine a criminal justice system that prioritizes recovery, prevention, civic inclusion, rather than punishment? A criminal justice system that acknowledges the legacy of exclusion that poor people of color in the U.S. have faced and that does not promote and perpetuate those exclusions. And finally, a criminal justice system that believes in black young people rather than treating black young people as the enemy to be rounded up. The good news is that we already are. A few years ago, Michelle Alexander wrote The New Jim Crow, which got Americans to see incarceration as a civil rights issue of historic proportions in a way they had not seen it before. President Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder have come out very strongly on sentencing reform, on the need to address racial disparity in incarceration. We're seeing states throughout stop and frisk as the civil rights violation that it is. We're seeing cities and states decriminalize possession of marijuana. New York, New Jersey, and California have been dropping their prison populations, closing prisons, while also seeing a big drop in crime. Texas has gotten into the game now, also closing prisons, investing in education. This curious coalition is building from the right and the left, made up of former prisoners and fiscal conservatives, of civil rights activists and libertarians, of young people taking to the streets to protest police violence against unarmed black teenagers and older, wealthier people. Some of you are here in the audience pumping big money into decarceration initiatives. In a deeply divided Congress, the work of reforming our criminal justice system is just about the only thing that the right and the left are coming together on. I did not think I would see this political moment in my lifetime. I think many of the people who have been working tirelessly uh, to write about the causes and consequences of our historically high incarceration rates did not think we would see this moment in our lifetime. The question for us now is, how much can we make of it? How much can we change? I want to end with a call to young people, the young people attending college and the young people struggling to stay out of prison or to make it through prison and return home. It may seem like these paths to adulthood are worlds apart, but the young people on these two, participating in these two institutions conveying us to adulthood, they have one thing in common. Both can be leaders in the work of reforming our criminal justice system. Young people have always been leaders in the fight for equal rights, the fight for more people to be granted dignity and a fighting chance at freedom. The mission for the generation of young people coming of age in this, a sea change moment, potentially, is to end mass incarceration and build a new criminal justice system. Emphasis on the word justice. Thanks. Excellent. Okay, so that's why I really was, you know, wanted to devote a few minutes of my presentation to that because it just summarizes the issue uh, so nicely and so passionately. So 
Many years ago, uh, UVI, in conjunction with the Law Enforcement Planning Commission, um, they, they con commissioned some UVI researchers, which included Dr. Frank Mills, to kind of look at some of these issues of incarceration uh, from a local level and, 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 and look at the data. And Well, let's say the report was about this thick. <laughs> and if anybody wants to reference the full document, contact uh, Dr. Mills. But one of the things that came out of it was, of course, like nationally, there are some characteristics that are sort of predictors of youth becoming involved in juvenile justice. So one of the things we found, the earlier youth in co uh, contacted juvenile justice settings, uh, the more likely they were to have continued involvement. Sort of early manifestations of rebelliousness and nonconformity, low academic achievement, poor parent and child interaction, drug use at an early age, disorganized and impoverished neighborhoods, and, and peers being involved in delinquent behavior. And by the way, I am going to sort of um, not read verbatim, but I'm going to sort of talk about some of the writing on the slides for those in our audience who may have visual impairments so they can kind of get the information as well through their uh, auditory channels. So Dr. Mills' research sort of supported national research and somebody asked the question well you know this happened in Georgia this happens here but does it relate to the Virgin Islands and it does because people are people and uh, the issues that confound us here in the Virgin Islands are confounding people in Georgia and Bermuda and Texas and California it's a worldwide problem uh, uh, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention has cited uh, characteristics related to the individual, the family, the peer group, and the school and community as being particularly salient uh, in this issue of school to prison um, pipeline. Now, there has some, been some really interesting research that's emerged regarding risk and resilience. And uh, the foundation of, the, of this research, some of you guys remember Mother Hale and Hale House, and she was taking care of the children who were called, quote unquote, crack babies. And one of the things uh, some earlier researchers around uh, risk and resilience discovered was that, you know, these young kids, they were born, the proper term is to drug addicted mothers and they had poverty, and they had all these sort of things working against them about why they shouldn't succeed. And lo and behold, some of these youths actually did quite well. And they were saying, you know, what is this thing that we call resilience? What is this thing that allows young people to thrive, not just survive, but actually thrive, even though they have all these things piled against them? And out of that became the research we now know as the research on risk and resilience. And what they really figured out is that there's no magic and there's no secret. Being successful is simply a matter of having more protective factors than risk factors. So the more protective factors we can pile up and, and wrap around young people, the better they are so, sort of to ward off some of the ills from those risk factors. And what they also discovered was that certain protective factors uh, sort of weighed a little more, were more powerful. And they found two protective factors, one in particular that even if kids only had this one thing, they could actually make it. And I do want you guys to guess. I want you to guess what the most powerful protective factor is. Oh. I heard two, you guys are quick, <laughs> you guys are good. Uh, so one of the senators said having both parents, and I heard somebody else say an M word, which was mentorship, having a mentor. Having a mentor meaning one responsible adult, not two, not 12, not 100, just having one responsible, caring adult in a child's life can ward off a host of evils. Now, guess what the second most powerful protective factor was? And some people, some people differ on the weight of these protective factors, but one body of research cited mentorship as the most powerful, but guess what they found as the second most powerful protective factor? So, say it again. Safe environment, it's important, but not what these researchers found. And I'll give you a hint, it has a little bit to do with the topic of this forum today education, being literate, being able to read. Positive mentor, literacy. Two of the strongest protective factors we can offer young people. 
school failure, of course, uh, is a big predictor. So school to prison pipeline, it is sometimes actually called cradle to prison pipeline. And as scary as that sounds, um, we can actually predict who is going to become delinquent probably as early as like two years old. And we're gonna kind of look into this a little more and we're gonna talk about early intervention later in the presentation as one of the, the key places where we have to intervene. Um, officially, it's the policies that push our nation's school ch children, especially our most at risk school children, out of classrooms and into juvenile justice and criminal settings. That's a definition by the American Civil Liberties Union. So here's just a little bit of data, just kind of nationally, how these trends are manifesting between school attainment and incarceration that I think are important to note. Uh, we see 30 to 70 percent of youth in correction and detentions. Uh, detention centers have learning disabilities, behavioral or emotional problems. I mean, that's almost 70%. If that doesn't tell you something's wrong, illiteracy rates um, for incarcerated populations in some states are as high as 70%. So, hmm, 70% of a population can't read. I wonder, I wonder if there's anything to that. High school dropouts, 82% of the adult incarcerated population. School-related offenses count for a majority of uh, the initial contact that youth face for juvenile justice. So we're talking status offenses, disrupting public school, truancy, um, or curfew violations, what, whatever, things that, you can, that are only illegal because of your age. Uh, now, this was an interesting data point, um, something that came out of um, uh, a colleague in the AUCD network that there is a statistically significant relationship between emotional and social skills demonstrated in kindergarten and adult outcomes, such as mental health, employment, substance abuse, and educational attainment. So as we look at this issue, I mean, we are looking at it across the lifespan, but we have to understand that when we're having these unruly teenagers at 16 and 17, it's very important for us to understand that this started at five years old, four years old, three years old. Okay. Um, additional data out of uh, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Um, children who engage in delinquent behavior before the age of 13 showed signs of problem behavior in their first years of life. Uh, and of course, if we can prevent delinquency, we can make our communities more safe, save ourselves a bunch of money, and just have happier, more productive citizens. School failure, as you can guess, leads to lifetime of poverty, unemployment, underemployment, um, and of course, reading proficiency has been implicated as, you know, a, a major predictor of, uh, kids who will become delinquent. So when I was writing this, my dissertation, there was a, a statistic floating around that a certain state, uh, they never named the state, sometimes you heard it Mississippi, sometimes you heard it South Carolina, but there was this uh, certain state that actually predicted the number of prison beds that they were going to need by the third grade standardized test scores. And uh, in trying to track down that stat, I discovered it wasn't a real stat. But what it was, was somebody who had been working in this field, and what she was basically saying was, you know what, the correlation is so strong that we might as well predict how many prison beds we're gonna need based on third grade standardized test scores. And one of the things the research tells us about third grade, that third grade reading level, is that if kids aren't reading to proficiency by third grade, chances are, without a targeted intervention, they're not really going to catch up. U.S. Virgin Islands does lead the Caribbean in incarceration rates. This is um, from Harney and uh, Farrell Hawley, which are uh, university researchers with the Virgin Islands. Um, and the US, U.S. Virgin Islands is the fifth um, largest uh, incarcerator in the world rel relative, to our, relative to our population. 
Um, and of course, uh, UVI researchers Harney and Farrell Hawley in 2012 found that by providing increased opportunities for education to inmates, we were actually able to lower rates of recidivism and repeat offending. So there's one solution right there. And you know, we can intervene anywhere along the line. We don't, ideally, we can intervene at a young age, but you know, we can intervene at the, at the incarceration setting. Zero tolerance policies, are they helping or hurting? Well, let's look at the data. I love this poster, it says, now, the, the darker bold words, I'd like you guys to say them, say them aloud after I read the statement. If a child doesn't know how to read, if a child doesn't know how to swim, if a child doesn't know how to multiply, if a child doesn't know how to drive, but if a child doesn't know how to behave, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we teach, but more often times we punish them. You know, I was talking to um, Abdul Ali uh, on the radio, and one of the things we were talking about this, and you know, a lot of times we just say, you know what, kids should just know. They should just know how to behave. When I was younger, I knew how to behave, and my parents did this, and I got a spanking, and I just knew, and then I changed my behavior, and, and everything was good. Well, you know, things are a little bit different. And you were lucky, probably most of us in here typically developing, maybe had a lot of supports in the community. And so a lot of uh, what we needed to know for success came naturally. Some students don't quite know how to behave. Sometimes it's a matter of being very explicit in teaching these skills. Uh, and again, if we look at our data, let's remember that these are kind of issues that are manifesting at a very early age. You know, that kid that can't sit still in your classroom in eighth grade, chances are he was a squirmy kid in <laughs> early inter in Head Start. So there are specific things that we can do and should do to actually teach these socially appropriate skills. And we're gonna talk about some of those. So zero tolerance, it was a great idea, let's be tough on crime, let's, you know, let's make it happen and kids, and then they're gonna learn and then they'll see and then the uh, communities will be safer and everything will be better. But when we're actually looking at the data as to how these policies played out, um, it has increased referrals to juvenile justice settings, um, criminalized typical behavior like, um, uh, Alice Goffman spoke about in the video, the kid gets his head pushed in the snow and then it becomes an assault charge. And you saw where that whole thing led. Um, this is a great quote. If the pipeline is not interrupted and youth do not do well on, while on probation, additional harm ensues. Time spent in juvenile justice settings is at best difficult and at worst significantly harmful for most adolescents. So this is really a clear statement that our juvenile justice settings are not acting as the rehabilitative facilities that they're supposed to be. I've worked with many uh, juveniles throughout my career and I can tell you I've heard horror stories um, about the types of assaults that take place and the stuff that goes down and you know, we think, oh, and this is, where, this is somewhere we sent this young person to get better. No, sometimes they get worse. It is a national priority, which Senator Francis uh, shared with us. You know, President Barack Obama certainly has brought this to the forefront. Um, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in 2014 issued a policy statement uh, indicating just that we have to absolutely look at the way we are suspending kids, expelling them, taking them away from opportunities to be engaged with school, and just creating uh, this massive, massive pipeline to prisons. There's actually an excellent report. Um, I'm happy to send it to you, but you can Google, you know, you can always Google U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, school to prison pipeline, or things of that sort. But and any information in this presentation you'd like, feel free to contact me. And the goal of all this is to prevent and severely limit suspensions and expulsions in early childhood. Now, even as you read that sentence, suspensions and expulsions, early childhood, it doesn't even seem to make sense. You know, kids in early childhood settings get sus getting suspended and expelled, but the reality is it's happening, and it's happening a lot. 
And when we, we look at the data about the earlier children are exposed to incarceration settings and how important early education is, we see that, wow, we're in our effort to sort of do something or fix something, we're inadvertently having the opposite effect. Um, data from the Office of uh, Civil Rights uh, uh, reported that um, preschool expulsions are definitely racially disproportionate, where black students comprise 18% of the pop preschool population nationally, but 42% um, have been suspended at least once and 48% more than once. Now this brings up an important point. The last time I shared this information, you know, somebody said, well, there's all this information about racial disparities and this and that, but you know, we're the Virgin Islands, we're a majority black community. So how come this is still manifesting? And I guess the one thing I will just say to that is that as uh, black people and people of color and Caucasian people and Hispanic and whomever from various different backgrounds, um, simply because we may be of a race uh, that is represent representative of the population, it doesn't mean that we are exempt from having harmful policies and practices. And um, like, I, like I shared with somebody, sort of racism and institutional racism, we understand that it has done a lot of harm in the community. We understand the harm that it's done throughout the years. But oftentimes we don't actually look at the harm it's done to ourselves. And uh, just concepts of um, how we think and how we feel about ourselves and about others like us in the community. So just a point of consideration as we think about uh, these issues. Now, um, Davidson in 2015 cited uh, a study out of the University of Pennsylvania indicating that um, schools with increased poverty and higher minority enrollment were more likely to use punitive and disciplinary tactics. Children's Defense Fund data indicates every two seconds a student is suspended from school, so that's at least a handful since we've been talking together this morning. Um, 25 to 30% of youth with short-term incarceration in short-term incarceration settings were involved with child services at one point. And in long-term facilities, this number increases to 50 to 60%. Now this should be a very scary, saddening statistic. By the way, when we did our research in the juvenile court, this is one of the other correlations that we found a statistically significant relationship with. Students are deprived. So there, sometimes their first contact with courts is not a school-related offense. Sometimes it's deprivation because something their parents or caregivers did. But even when they're coming into contact with the system at an early age, childcare, it, it sort of comes deprivation right on to delinquency. And so now we know, okay, education is a big thing, poverty is a big thing. So students that are involved in child services, these are the students we need to be wrapping our, our arms and our resources around because the data suggests that they will become delinquent. It is a national priority, as mentioned again, U.S. Department of Justice hosted a Rethink Discipline Conference that focused on alternative to suspension and expulsion um, to keep youth in school um, based on principles associated with President Obama's My Brother's Keeper. And I think we even had a march today, you know, 100 black men. And if you didn't see the article, President Obama, in support of this idea of mentorship being an incredibly strong protective factor, he's actually calling for 100 men, adults, positive people to step up and not 100, 1 million. I mean, talk about solving the problem on a large scale and at a grassroots level. We know that it takes a mentor. So he's saying, okay, I need one million of you guys to mentor one million of these students. And I think it's gonna work. Okay, so interestingly enough, there are some protections in the federal law for people with disabilities and school failure that, um, have to do with um, when discipline comes up, when it's time to suspend, when it's time to expel. 
uh, we're really supposed to look at, hmm, well, are they getting an appropriate education? You know, if they have behavior challenges, do they have an appropriate IEP? Is there an appropriate behavior plan? Has there been a functional behavior assessment done? But unfortunately, even though these processes are in the law, they don't often get exercised. Uh, and a lot of students are missing out on the due process that they are afforded to under federal law. Okay, so let's get into the solution. Um, as I mentioned, this really became the topic of my dissertation research, and I was in Hawaii and doing my work, and a former professor called me. He said, hey, this thing just came across my desk. It sounds right up your alley. And what it was was an opportunity to work at the juvenile court in Fulton County and run the first ever, not first ever, but that facility was the first to have this program, a court-based advocacy program where there was a court-based person assigned to actually look at the needs of kids with disabilities that were getting involved in juvenile justice. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. This is also the topic of my dissertation research. And we had some pretty awesome outcomes. So uh, it was founded in 2014, and it was sort of like a multi-tiered uh, way of intervening. We had a committee, we had a team, we were meeting with the schools and working and meeting with families and just every, we were sort of doing things in a very smart way to deal with this issue. So Georgia law, like probably VI law, mandated that juvenile court judges are supposed to uh, consider relevant educational documents at dispositional hearings, but oftentimes those documents weren't provided. Sometimes if they were provided, judges were like, well, what do I do with this? You know, they didn't, they didn't really know what to do with it. And um, just, just a, a breakdown in communication between the schools and the courts in general. Um, the history of this movement, um, again, in 1998, the judges kind of noticed an increased uh, amount of referrals coming from the schools. There was an initial grant. Um, the first advocate they hired was an attorney. Then they realized that they sort of needed more of a special education uh, specialist. And uh, then I kind of came on board around 2014 and the program just expanded, 2004, and the program expanded in major ways. So it was a multidisciplinary group. And the thing that I'm so excited about is that we are a multidisciplinary group right here. So we've got educators, we've got legal people, we've got legislatures, we've got uh, clergy, uh, members of the clergy, um, disability ex experts, and just a number of people from different disciplines that can really come together. In the case of Atlanta, of course, we had people from Atlanta Legal Aid, people from the school systems, Atlanta volunteer lawyers, um, child policy researchers, we had people from the courts, people from the schools, advocacy organizations, people from the public defender's office, again, more university researchers, parents. We had some private donors. We had civil rights organizations and other sorts of nonprofits coming together. So how did we do our work? Well, we said, we know this is an issue. So we said, you know, if students are coming into the court and they have an IEP, it, it needs to be a red flag. We kind of gave the judges like a little, like if you see this, you may want to make a referral. Um, so students who had an IP, and the interesting thing is, I, I love to tell this story. On two occasions, you know, the work that we have to do is so tremendous, but we are well equipped and we can do it. Uh, when I first started at the court, my colleagues said, oh, these judges are never gonna do this, they're never gonna do this, they don't care. but one of the things I personally believe is that people do care. I don't care if you're black, if you're white, uh, Hispanic, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist. Um, no matter what background you come from, everybody cares. And I think it's a matter of presenting the information in a way so that everybody can understand it. Because once you see the information, you said, well, we have to act. And that was exactly the case with those judges. Once they really understood what this was about, they were more than happy to act. And even then, you know, with my, some of my colleagues who are researchers, I was at a conference once, and one of my colleagues said, oh, if only we can get the judges to stop locking these kids up. I said, oh, we're doing it. We're actually doing it in Georgia. So 
I think there is some cynicism, you know, maybe even about this forum. Maybe there were some cynics saying, oh, you know, it's just more, more, more talk, less action, and nothing's ever going to come of it. But no, I think something will come of it because we're, we're ready, we're equipped, and we know what it is we need to do, and we're going to learn more, and we're going to work together, and we're going to solve it. So students who are in the student support team, um, students exhibiting chronic school failure, or those with known reading difficulties. Vision or hearing impairments, actually one of the students we worked with, it turned out he was deaf in one ear. We actually found somebody who, for some reason, he w kind of went through most of his educational career without anybody realizing he could only hear out of one ear. So, uh, chronically truant, recently expelled, heightened sensitivity. Just a little bit of overview of uh, the population we were dealing with. That was the representation of our judges and probation staff. 95% um, African American. Now, nationally, black people represent about 12% of the population. In Fulton County, black people represented about 34% of the population, but in the court, 95%. Uh, of, of the people that were contacting the court system were uh, African Americans. Just a little breakdown of the type of cases, delinquency, deprivation, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to see some data now presented. The data that is green and blue represents the first data collection, which had to do with 89 subjects. And then the second data set you're going to see was really the data that was used uh, during the research, which was 367 subjects. And that data will be presented as red and beige. So just a little bit of a breakdown. Uh, we were, of course, dealing with the majority male population, 79% to 29%. Then, um, additionally, we had, um, again, the same disproportionate represent representation of males to females. Um, African American, Latino, and other. During our first uh, 89 uh, subjects, we, we had no uh, other. It's just African Americans and Latinos, but 96%. Similar, similar, uh, disproportionate <laughs> numbers uh, in the next data set. All right, so here's reading level. Uh, so what I have here in this graph, again, this is uh, representing of the first 89 students, but um, we have fifth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade just representing the average reading level one would be at if they were reading at proficiency at the end of that level of school. Then we had th the real reading levels of our data set. So our elementary school kids were reading at about um, 2.35 grade level. Middle school kids were reading at about third point fifth grade grade level. And our high school kids were reading at about third grade six month. Now here's some data related to IQ. Um, now there's been, there's been a number of interesting um, debates and studies surrounding IQ and we do know that IQ tests can be culturally biased. But one of the things the research tells us is that they're not biased enough to just skew the results. So yes, there is some cultural bias implicit in IQ tests, but it doesn't mean we can just throw it away. Now, IQ as being a measure of inherent intelligence, I have a lot of arguments and disagreements against that. But IQ as being a measure of the level of skills it's going to take to be successful in the world, that is something that we have to look at. So almost 80% of the youth had below average IQ scores. And 22% were average. Again, these are, this is data. This is the sort of span, the range, and the array of IQ scores. And I'm going to. Uh, Hello? Okay, good. Okay, I just want to kind of come over a little bit and talk about this. So we have like, you know, our, our lowest kids 
and then all the way up to 108, which is in the realm of average. So an average IQ score is about 90 to 110. President Obama's about a 130, by the way. Some say he might be a 150. But at any rate, um, the, the students with the majority, like the highest IQ score was somewhere around 70, which is borderline intellectual disability, what we used to call retarded. And again, this is not to say anything about the inherent intelligence of anybody, but this is a representation of where kids are and what we're expecting them to do with very little support. Again, um, uh, IQ by uh, referral. The majority of students had an IQ, in this one it was 89% or below, so in the below average range. None of the students were above average in this data set. These, this is a breakdown of students referred to the program by school level. So high school, most of the students in high school, then middle school, then elementary. Now, what we know about early intervention, ideally these numbers would have been reversed, you know, because our best chance is to intervene at a young age. But we see that the majority of students are really probably only getting a first look at the high school level. By school system, so we had, can I turn this microphone on? Thank you. City of Atlanta Public Schools uh, were the majority populators of this system, followed by Fulton County and then uh, other school systems. 32% uh, of our youth actually had, um, at the time of referral, were basically what we call intellectually disabled, what, which we used to call mentally retarded. And there is some debate as to whether these kids really should be involved in juvenile justice. And because now we're talking about basic issues of competency, um, you know, and then debates even over death penalty for, for people that have intellectual disabilities. And is it, is it, is it just, is it ethical to execute somebody um, with an intellectual disability? Okay, so students that had a disability at the time of referral, this is just some information regarding that. Type of disability, mostly emotional disturbances and behavior disorders, followed by learning disabilities, followed by intellectual disabilities. Literacy level. So the majority of students uh, associated with this project had reading levels that kind of topped out at third grade. And some less than that. Some more, you know, c couple that were above. DFAC's involvement, Department of Family and Children's Services, Child Services, so um, quite a few of the youth had uh, involvement with children's services. These are just um, referrals that uh, had to do with the alternative school. One of the, one of the things we know that even if you have a disability and you're sent to an alternative school, you should be provided with an adequate education, but um, the alternative school that was mostly represented had no capacity to even serve students with disabilities, yet many of, many of their population were students that had disabilities. So this is just a little breakdown of um, kind of some of our outcomes. So there were some youth, we were able to start that SST process, um, Get, get students eligible, revise that IEP, and then we had a small percentage that were referred to what we call Team Child, which was the team of attorneys working with us. So a little bit about the process. How did we do this work? So we had referrals. There was a court order, informal in-house referral, and telephone referral. And um, you know, I wouldn't actually recommend this again because we just were inundated. Once people kind of knew about this service, people were coming out of the woodwork, help my child, you know, this, and it, it really became pretty, pretty unbelievable how many referrals we were getting. 
Um, the referrals came from judges, from probation office, from agencies, mental health clinicians, parents, and attorneys. Um, most of the referrals came from judges. But this is a great thing because previously the judges would sort of see these things coming across their desk and just proceed to, you know, implement whatever justice they saw fit. But instead now they were saying, okay, let's pause. Let's make a referral. Let's look a little deeper at what is going on with this young person before I simply just send them to detention. Maybe there's some sort of intervention we can do while they're still in the community. So this was an amazing thing. Um, what we would typically do, we'd contact the family. Do uh, We subpoena the records from the school system. Um, we do a record review, schedule meetings um, in terms of intervention like IEP meetings or SST. On occasion, cases would be assigned to a special education attorney, and then we'd make a report to the court. And the judges would actually look at this report and use that information in their dispositional uh, decisions. Record review, we'd locate that IEP, um, locate current information, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just really look and say, based on what we know about the student, is there an appropriate educational program? Um, there were cases where um, maybe it just wasn't moving forward fast enough or there was some sort of egregious noncompliance um, or just a long history of noncompliance. And in those cases, we would refer them right away to an attorney for intervention. Uh, so we had a situation, there was a young student and he couldn't read. He was reading at a first grade level and he was a senior. And his mother had been asking for help for a while. Middle school, help, help, help. High school, help, help, nothing. Uh, he even had a scholarship to college. But he ended up getting injured, so his scholarship went away. And now we had a 12th grader who's reading at a first grade level. And what's he really going to do? So in this case, we says, OK, I think we're going to just give this one to an attorney <laughs> to deal with. Um, all right, so report to the court, just, it was a just basic nice overview of uh, a, a basic profile and most importantly, recommendations. So for my dissertation, I wanted to know, so we're doing all this work and uh, I wasn't always a data person, but I have become a lover of data. I, I love data and I love measurable outcomes because it's really a matter of sometimes we're working hard. Actually, all the time we're working hard. We're always working hard and always hustling and always trying to make things happen, but sometimes it's a matter of working smarter rather than harder. So I wanted to really look objectively at the data and saying, is this program actually helping to decrease recidivism and is it helping to identify previously unmet educational needs? My hypothesis was directional, of course, in that um, a comprehensive educational advocacy program would decrease recidivism when compared with traditional probation services and short-term detention, and that it would increase rates of child find. And child find is sort of the federal mandate to locate, identify. We, we sometimes think of child find in relation to early intervention, but it's, it's across the student's lifespan. So the subjects, 367 youth who received um, what we call EA services, educational advocacy services, we had 280 males and 87 females. And what we did was we basically compared the data as we currently saw it with data from archival data related to special education diagnoses and archival data related to recidivism rates. The research design was something we call quasi-experimental. The independent variable, variable was this educational advocacy treatment program and the dependent variable was, of course, rates of child fine and recidivism. Um, our analysis, uh, statistical analysis, was a chi-square for those two outcomes, uh, child fine and recidivism, and then we did correlational analyses uh, for other relationships that weren't exactly related to the research. Things like um, DFAC's involvement and, you know, uh, court involvement. Okay, so let's look at the outcomes. So recidivism, one of our most important um, 
uh, outcome pieces, we did have a reduction in recidivism, and we had a 5% reduction in recidivism, but it was not statistically significant. And in research terms, when we're talking about statistical significance, we just mean how can we rule out that this is happening by chance? You know, maybe this happened by chance, and maybe this happened because of what you're doing. So the data that we came up with, unfortunately, did not uh, back up statistically that our reduction in recidivism was a result of this program. So that's just sort of, that's how the cookie crumbles. <laughs> uh, but in our question related to child find, were we identifying kids that were previously unidentified? It did come up statistically significant uh, to a rate of like a 300% increase in identification when compared with the two school systems that were populating the court. For APS schools as well as Fulton County. As I said, um, the EA intervention increased rates of child find by over 300%. It reduced recidivism by nearly 5%, but it was not statistically significant. We did find that a statistically significant number of students were sent to alternative schools that had no capacity to serve them. And a statistically significant number of youth with disabilities at the time of the referral had a charge of disrupting public school. Uh, other outcomes, uh, it was so much hard work, I mean, just an amazing amount of work, but you know, 900 students were served by this initiative. The court was able to establish a protocol of sharing records between the school systems. Um, we partnered with some of our researchers at Georgia State and we did Project Marvel, which was mentor-assisted research validated education and literacy, meaning we took our two strongest protective factors, having a mentor and being literate, and we're actually the mentors were delivering reading instruction. And that was an awesome, awesome benefit. Um, and we, we were able to make a lot of systematic changes just in the treatment of youth in Georgia. Parents reported feeling a lot more ability, increased ability to advocate for their children. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union did do a fact-finding mission just to kind of look into some other issues of systematic uh, problems. Some students got compensatory education, and then um, we were asked to, of course, um, give our input on changes to the state special education regulations, as well as the juvenile justice codes in Georgia. Um, we almost lost, launched a school-based men mental health program, but we were not able to, but the point was we, we tried, and maybe they still did after I left. Um, we had some sort of private donors donate some money and we were able to do some innovative things in the schools. And three court jurisdictions uh, asked to replicate our program, one of them being Cook County, which is the largest juvenile court in the United States. Um, just lots of different PR things that happened. Um, we did get an award best court program in Georgia from Georgia Council of Court Administrators. Uh, we were recognized by National Association of State Directors of Special Education as being a model state initiative. And Harvard University's Ash Institute on Innovations in American Government voted at top 100 programs in the nation. Um, and then we were also recognized by Juvenile Justice Special Education Shared Agenda as a model program. I'm going to briefly just go by data. This is just really... Um, when I was working in Bermuda, I was running an autism clinic at that time. Uh, it just turns out that they're having similar problems. And I'm going to kind of skip by this very briefly. But uh, same thing. What is this connection between literacy and incarceration in Bermuda? Um, various assessments that they use, similar breakdown between males and, and uh, blacks. Uh, their reading levels were slightly higher. Uh, some have attributed this to maybe a British system of education, maybe being slightly more rigorous, but still below where they needed to be proficient. Um, just uh, some more data regarding um, uh, education and uh, literacy rates. Uh, functional literacy, some say fifth, sixth grade, others have said ninth grade. Their population, you know, had an average of sixth grade. 74% um, of their study participants were functioning, uh, struggling with literacy. Um, relationship between reading and writing skills. 
deficits. Uh, I'm going to just kind of skip at this, 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 and that. So here's some just interesting data related to their IQ, sort of same, same issues with um, the majority of the population having lower IQs. Learning disabilities were present across the population. Um, issues with attention and focus, social skill deficits, uh, et cetera. So let's just get into the nuts and bolts of it. How do we end this cycle and what do we do? Well, it actually starts prenatally. This is something that Dr. Frank Mills concluded in his research. If we're really talking about early intervention, what we're talking about is increasing prenatal care. Because some of the problems that end up emerging with young kids are biological that we can sort of address even in the womb. All right, so this is our awesome flyer. We are opening up at VIU said something called the ADDRC, Autism and Developmental Disabilities, Re Disabilities Research Center, early intervention. We want to teach the practitioners the very best cutting edge research-based methods of how to intervene. So when they have their students that are one years old to five years old, we're going to be able to teach them the very best that the state of the field has to offer in terms of early intervention. And we're totally psyched about that. We're having a grand opening on April 15th, and we invite you all to come. Uh, some people frame, like when you have a new business, they frame their dollars. We actually framed our data. So these are just some of the outcomes that we, we had with some of the first students we worked with and that we hope to teach others about how to get. So receptive skills when the student first started. And by the way, these data that you're seeing, three months. It took three months for us to get these results. This is why I'm talking about working smarter, not harder. We know what the best practices are. It's just a matter of implementing them. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Here, here. All right. So an increase in receptive skills from nothing to almost over 20 in a three-month time. Motor imitations. And all of these skills are related to language and learning. Tacting skills and echoic skills. Major increases, three months' time. Now, let's look at the problem behavior. These behaviors that are getting kids kicked out of early intervention settings, well, we can deal with that. We know how to fix behavior. We can actually teach kids to behave better. We know what to do. And this is what we're calling applied behavior analysis. It's the science of changing behavior. And we know quite a bit about it. So polling, can you imagine? Down to rates of zero. And this is daily. This is per day. Frequency gestural assault. So this is not assaulting people, but this is you know sort of coming in threatening ways towards people. Down to rates of zero. Tantruming. So yes, maybe the student tantruming nearly 35 times a day would have gotten kicked out, but now they're able to be ready for learning. But guess what? If we don't do this work at an early age, is it going to get better? It's not going to get better. And I love this one, self-injury. Look at this beautiful data regarding self-injury you know, him actually injuring himself. And this is a four-year-old, okay? So, but now he's ready, now he's ready for learning. So, literacy initiatives. We have to find ways to develop, um, ways to increase that reading level. We can emulate best practices. There are so many models. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We need to increase our literacy efforts. Less TV, more books. Mentorship, okay? If the president can do it, we can do it. Uh, I mentioned President Obama has called for one million school-aged children to be linked up to with one million mentors, each one teach one. One of um, my friends likes to say a lot, if not me,